Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, the ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Well, today's topic, I've had to redo about five, six times. And the reason is, in part, it can end up being a rabbit hole of just a lot of data that you'll stop listening to in a sentence or two or a paragraph or two. And yet the data is kind of important. So like with all things in life, it's choosing what to talk about, what not to talk about, and hitting the main points. So today's topic is about artificial sweeteners, sweeteners in general. And there's really two aspects of this. So remember, this is keto naturopath. So this has to do with ketogenic diet, the ketogenic way of eating. But at the same time, it has to do with general health. And my perspective is, and how I'm leading this series of podcasts, is that I'm investigating things that are important to me that I never had time to investigate while I was practicing. When you practice, you just don't have time. It's the patient in front of you. It's the the clinic business and um, on and on. So you'll go to conferences to catch up, but then you go back into the trenches of patient care and it's day in and day out and usually long days. So you see conditions and you might know some of the pathophysiology of the conditions to an extent that you need to know that to be able to treat it, but you don't know the why of a lot of situations. So the first things started creeping out of, cropping up in my practice or the areas of environmental medicine, that is, it's not all just diet. And that's sort of obvious. We started learning some of that even in, in medical school. So we took, I took an advanced standing another year of education through Dr. Crinian. Look that name up. He's uh, one of the more brilliant people that I think anyway, in my life that I've met on env- environmental medicine. So teasing that aspect out of one's Uh, diet, the day-to-day existence, usually it's through diet, sometimes it's through water, sometimes it's through air, mostly it's through diet, is important. And that was a big deal. So now you have basic nutrition, you have environmental medicine, and um, those are pretty much the the top two things to look at. And you can go to a lot of different areas. So that's a, and then you, the other overlay was uh, genetics, what they call nutrigenomics, and that's the interface of genes with nutrition and to the degree we know about that. So that aspect now is something that you can go into 23andMe and you can download your raw data or actually upload your raw data into one of a number of different uh, apps that will analyze that data and give you a list of all your mutations, all your SNPs, singular nuclear polymorphisms. And the ones that you're homozygous for would be the ones that I would look at. And uh, you can go on and on. So that's become a big area. You can get swamped with information there and not know where to start. And physicians are likewise there. Okay then, but so back to sweeteners. Why do I say that in the context of sweeteners? Well, with all these artificial sweeteners, and we'll name them in a little bit, is that we are dealing with environmental toxicity. These are, for the most part, synthetic aspects. We'll find some that are natural, quote unquote, and uh, they are synthetic. And they started a long time ago, I'll give a brief history of some of these. Uh, the first rabbit hole is to is about the history. Uh, the history is often sorted. It's very has a lot to do with uh, paying corporations and the lobbyists to get things passed against the health of the citizenry, uh, against uh, against public health concerns. And that's a big deal. And that's, that's, that's disheartening to think that the public health concerns are not the number one uh, aspect that get these bills passed by Congress. It's basically the changing hands of money. And that's it. So deciding not to, and in some of my former podcasts on this particular issue, when I started, I was determined to just go on and on and on about that particular aspect of this, because I was 
is an expression I use a lot, um, usually in regards to some of my sisters, but uh, this time in regards to myself, is that we can be dangerously naive about how we look at things. And I think it is now dangerously naive to think that uh, the government is benign, it's effective, it's, and I'm not saying overthrow the government, I'm just saying that to have absolute trust in the FDA and their oversight in this particular case of understanding what is safe and what is not safe. So they regulate pesticides, what they consider uh, generally referred to as safe grass for food, they regulate additives to foods. And so it's a big responsibility. So in all that, in the thousands and thousands of uh, new additives and that are being reviewed, either being approved or not approved, and same with pesticides, it's really a, uh, an impossible job to be sympathetic to those situations. However, the story of some of the approvals of some of these uh, artificial sweeteners is nothing less than criminal. Uh, sorry to say, and a lot of people have been hurt by these particular decisions. So I've opted out not to go into the details of that. We'll call it the lobbyist shenanigans, the financial shenanigans of getting these things approved, but I will post the links to those stories so you can, and they've now been, by the way, this is not just me getting to be conspiratorial. Uh, going back from 19, I'm sorry, 2005 to 2016, you'll see some of these stories uh, reiterated from, let's say, the Idaho Times to the Huffington Post to Dr. Mercola to uh, various uh, health blogs, notable health blogs, to uh, the Center for Science and the Public Interest to the, uh, anyways, on and on. So it's not isolated. But the other thing that has evolved, and then back to the concept of being da dangerously naive, is that you know, back in the 1990s and the early 200s, when the internet just became available, so this idea that you could actually at least read and download studies that would take you days to go into a, a university library and fr find these things out and uh, go to the photocopier and print them out and then take them back to your office and read them when you had time, you know, it suddenly you get these things online and you just have a printer and you can print a lot of these things. So, the sites that you would go then would be Google Scholar and uh, PubMed, and they had a higher degree of, I won't say they are, they are a good organization, but it, now uh, knowing that uh, a lot of professionals go online to these particular sites to look for truthful information, pharmaceutical companies in particular, and I'm including the companies that make various additives for food, they put out pseudo studies, ones that in the abstract look good, and the study may may or may not have been done correctly, or the whole thing was fraudulent from the beginning, and they had a ghostwriter sort of, and this is known. For instance, Pfizer's got caught a couple times with this. So this now muddies the water. And then you go on to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia isn't 100% known, but you're trying to balance what you're reading with these different references. So that's where you come to your conclusion. And now you have YouTube, and you pick out your favorite, uh, most trustworthy person to cover a particular issue, and that's how your opinion comes together. So what I'm saying is times have changed. Uh, I no longer can trust what I read on PubMed or Google Scholar or Wikipedia because all these things can be changed and that's unfortunate. So where do you find the truth? Um, you find this truth in studies that are done overseas for the most part. So that's where I go. Scandinavia, Europe, uh, sometimes Japan, even China. So you get another consensus out there. So that's the kind of the second generation of using the internet for finding out. So back to sweeteners. Sweeteners, when we talk about sweeteners, specifically looking through the window of ketones and glucose, all right? This is the one little box, and this one little box in this particular topic is going to be a little bit on the hyper-simplistic way of looking at it, because we can talk about what, what affects your blood glucose and what affects your ketones, but they may be very dangerous things to take. So it's a small little window we're gonna look through initially, I'll mention that, and then we'll get into some health aspects. Uh, maybe, or maybe I'll just cross the board, cancel it. So when we're looking, assuming you're interested in the ketogenic diet and you're looking for what kind of sweeteners to use, what kind of sweeteners to 
to bake with or to cook with or to put into your various creations you're making in your kitchen, like like Judy does my wife. She's always making something interesting, and it's kind of like a, a chemistry lab down in the kitchen now. Not everything works out, and what sweeteners to use at certain things, and preferably no sweeteners at all. So that's why I want to start. If you're on keto and you're really... Uh, are you know you have your glucometer down and you um, you take your ketometer readings your ketone readings sparingly you know maybe you've gone through a period of taking it intensely and then you put it away and then you a month later you try it again to see if you're on track that's a smart way of doing it or you've done some before and after testings of certain things the best sweetener to use is no sweetener at all I just want to say that if 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 you can go with no sweetener at all and basically let your own taste buds change through the evolution of uh, ketosis on the ketogenic diet, you will get healthier faster. You will not have to sort of have this one layering of this artificial thing for the most part or another additive to come into your metabolism. But most people are not that pure. So that's the reality. Most people are not that pure and they want to know what can they use. And so what do I have in my counter for me? I do have stevia. I have a little powder of stevia that I use. A lot of people don't like stevia, and stevia comes in really a thousand different forms. So you have to, not only powder or droplets, but the companies that make them and the extracts that they take from stevia are also different. So you have to do your own trial and error. So I've come up with what I like, and I still try to use less and less of it. The other one that I use is xylitol, and that's been around since my early days of practice. A lot of people have problems with xylitol. GI problems. And also xylitol is, you know, there is caloric content to xylitol. There is no caloric content to stevia. So xylitol will increase your blood sugar to an extent, but it's less than sugar. Some people say it gives them GI problems. So back in the early 2000s, it was the one that I'd referred to my patients. And I'm not saying it's lost favor. It's just, I just stick with stevia and my goal is to have less and less stevia. The new sweetener on the market, which is actually what they call a rare natural sugar, I guess you call it a fruit sugar, is allulose. I don't have enough experience of that. I don't have good or bad. I've actually never tried it, but it is the one that's in various, you know, protein bars and so on and so forth. I've heard good things about it. I've read a lot of uh, studies on it. My only concern about the studies, they all come from the same place in Japan. And uh, usually when all those studies are about one place, it's the company that makes this thing, and of course they're going to have glowing reports on it. So apart from that, but the people that have actually used it said you know, they like it, and they've checked it out on their blood glucose and their ketone levels. I will say there is a, I think, a very clever uh, video of a couple, I think they're called Keto Connect, which basically line up all the, most of the um, sugar substitutes, and they take the equivalent sweetness, the sweetness equivalent of that particular sweetener, and they measure how it affected their glucose and their ketone levels, and they put it in a graph, and they share that publicly. That's been a very popular video for good reasons, because they did some good work. However, that is only looking through. If if that was the only criteria in your life, you would think uh, aspartame was great. You would think sucralose was great. You would think uh, they didn't do uh, ACE-K, but they did pretty much all the others. And I would say, given, and, and their predisposition was stevia, and they were just trying allulose initially, thinking that well, they're going to go for allulose for a while. That's their next one. But so it's just looking through the keyhole of what affects your glucose and what affects your ketones. And I'll, I'll be happy to post that in a link there. You can go look at that. But I'm saying the problem with going to a lot of these keto conferences and so on, it becomes to a pretend world that ketones and glucose readings are all that our world depends on. So it doesn't matter if something is toxic or not. It just matters how it affects your glucose or your ketone levels. And that has a truth, but that verges on what I call keto stupid. That verges on what I consider a dangerously naive perspective to take on the ketogenic diet. So you have to layer both what is out there in terms of toxicity, biological problems. And I think I'm drowning in studies. I obviously need no more information. I just need to sort of paraphrase what I know. What I'd like to do is to, uh, and I'm going to make it this at least a two podcast 
series because there's a lot to cover. And I think that it is a good idea to, to drill down to what they call the sugar alcohols, which are all the sugars that end in I-T-O-L. That's the xylitol, that's the erythritol, that's the mannitol, the sorbitol, those three and how they're made and, and, and how that is experiencing with you, you know, how that, how that happens. That's good. The monk fruit, that's another new one that's out there. That didn't work well for me at all, but it, I've heard other people it works well for them. So there's not enough information on the, the, the monk fruit. Allulose, there's, you know, I, I would say that would be the new, new item on the block to try, but there's just not enough information there to, to compare to all these others. So if there was one lesson, if there was absolutely one lesson that I wanted you to take seriously and that is to know that aspartame, and which has a terribly storied past, and a link that has been covered, as I say, from Mark Cola to the Huffington Post to uh, the Idaho Times to probably the LA Times and New York Times, et cetera, et cetera, about the shenanigans and how people were paid off and then right up to the level of the president. So you can read about that. So that went off of patent in 1991-92, and so... The company, Monsanto, behind that needs to find something else to be patentable. And that's when they have their monopoly for a short period of time. So the next generation of aspartame is called uh, neotamine, N-E-O-T-A-M-E. And then there's another one. And so that was patented in 2002. And the next one after that is called advanamine, which is A-D-V-A-N-T-A-M-E. And that was uh, patented 2014, so very recently. So the corporate profit here, the corporate or the profit motive for corporations is to get something on patent out there as soon as possible and start making money with it. Pretty straightforward. You know, I'm not against that, but the idea of uh, insufficient testing is uh, makes it very dangerous. And so there's a lot of those three. Consider aspartame, neotine, and, and advanadine, advantamy, pretty much the same thing. Just reincarnations of the same thing, slightly different things added to it. Then after that, you have sucralose. Sucralose is a chlorinated glucose. And here's interesting. This came out in the late 90s, I believe it's 98, when sucralose came out. Um, so I would put sucralose in the family of chlorinated, of organochlorinated pesticides, because this is cl- what we call chlorinated glucose. And that once this came out, everybody thought it was the big panacea, that uh, the rate of Crohn's disease and ulcerated colitis jumped by 100% in Canada that year. And so then they started measuring, taking measures around the world, the United States, uh, well, other places, Japan, other places, this was starting to be used, and they found that uh, gut issues, specifically Crohn's and uh, colitis, increased from year after year after year. The most stunning was in Canada. And then a study came out, and I don't want to get too much in the details of all this, but a study was artificial sweeteners induce glucose intolerance by altering gut microbiota. Now, that's such a stiff title that you make make it makes it sound like eh, it's okay you know I'm um, okay so I got a little disturbance a little GI disturbance I can I can deal with that well it's a lot worse than that once you uh, realize that the gut is really your your second brain and there's a lot of associations with uh, neurological disorders and your gut metabolism you realize how important that is and it's on that principle that you'll find that there's a lot of neurotoxicity with aspartame um, as with sucralose Saccharin goes back to the 19, early 1900s, and that's actually a coal tar derivative. So that's the overall. It's best to do nothing and think about what you're expecting. If you're, if you're entering into a, the ketogenic diet, and assuming you're doing it to improve your health, and if you're just going to stuff all your things with artificial sweeteners, um, then you're kind of defeating the purpose. But let's start with the the worst ones. Let's see, aspartame. Aspartame has an interesting story. And it took more than a decade for aspartame 
to pick up where uh, cyclamate left off. So cyclamate was, I'm not even going to cover cyclamate. Cyclamate's within the 50s and 60s, and it's been down and out for a while. So after that was taken off the list, uh, uh, cyclamate, uh, sorry, aspartame came on. And it was a, an accidental discovery by, in, by a guy who worked for GD Cyril. And uh, he happened to lick his fingers after he was working on a new ultra drug in 1965. Tasted sweet. Uh, the next thing we knew, it was aspartame, a combination of aspartic acid and phenylalanine. That's a dangerous combination, especially for epilepsy, which is interesting because ketogenic diet is used for epilepsy. That was the origin of the ketogenic diet. Remember, we covered that many podcasts ago. So aspartame is 200 times sweeter and basically doesn't affect your glucose. So it's a big hurrah. Then it went through stopping and going and it was actually taken off and the company got caught for fraudulent research. It was pushed through by Rumsfeld. But on that link, one thing that helped push it through was a whistleblower of the early 2000s. And he was one of the directors for the FDA. He subsequently went off on his own to do his own sort of police work. And I'm sure he's had his own life of hard knocks to face after that. So the problem with aspartame, and now I'm reading from a 16 page document by this former director who is called Arthur Amadalista. So the problem with aspartame, this is, this is 2002 report includes not only the biochemical nature of this toxin, but also it sheds light on the political nature of the players involved and the changes in the regulatory policies and the regulations resulting from corporate government ties and the politicians closely associated with these ties. What I can tell you regarding toxicology, histology, biochemistry, is that aspartame is highly, a highly toxic, a highly neurotoxic. Its components easily transcend the blood-brain barrier interfering with normal cell function. This affects the glutathione and calcium mechanisms in place, destroying nerve cell integrity, causing brain lesions, lower intelligence levels, compromised human and animal physiology, and biological systems resulting in injury and death. Aspartame contains methyl alcohol, the kind that makes you go blind. The methanol, which is another word for methyl alcohol, then breaks down into formal formaldehyde formic acid components, which denatures, mutates the DNA. That's a known scientific fact. The subsequent results of this interaction from the isolates genetically from the isolates of genetically modified amino acids in the methanol is nerve cell death and subsequent organ system degradation. The hypothalamus alone, the major controller of much of the endocrine system, is especially high risk to these effects, thereby affecting many other organ systems. This is why we have such a diverse array of symptoms. I've seen firsthand the effects on symptoms when individuals have abstained from ingesting the artificial sweetener, aspartame. Make no bones about it, that aspartame is a major factor in many symptomatic injuries and illnesses due to its effect on brain chemistry. Okay, enter into my clinical experience. So in the early 2000s, late 1900s, one of the rote things that all patients had to do was a seven-day diet diary and writing down all that they ate and everything they put on it. So if they put on aspartame or they had Diet Coke a lot, then I'd, we'd be able to tease that out. So it was pretty astounding to me, not knowing the why, but just hearing that this thing had a problem with it, is to take people off of all their aspartame as much as we knew. Back then, it was a little a little more conspicuous. Right now, we have the whole labeling things, and aspartame does not always have to be uh, included in the list of ingredients for a particular food. Probably didn't know that, huh? Yep, if it's below a certain threshold, it doesn't have to be listed. I got a story about that as well. So after having a number of patients, and that's all I did was take away their aspartame and help them find uh, a certain tea or something else that would replace their need to have uh, their drink or whatever it was, their symptoms would improve. Their rashes went away. Their joint pain went away. Their sleep improved. Their thinking was clear. So that was pretty outstanding. Still didn't know enough of all what I read you. That would have been nice to have that at that point. So that was the first of realizing there's a lot of bad stuff that are additives and medicine was becoming less and less about following people's blood work and saying, you're doing fine, your blood work's great, keep on going, and more and more about pulling toxic things out of their diet, 
So we started with artificial sweeteners and we went on to other things like pesticides and heavy metals. It's another story for another podcast. But this is that category. Uh, this is what we did. Okay, then. Aspartame was the main ingredient in Diet Coke, and now it's uh, changed over to two other synthetic artificial sweeteners. Hooray. So though the health complaints investigations linked to both aspartame and saccharin persisted throughout the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, it continued to climb into the 80s and 90s, the consumption of diet sodas climbed up into the 2000s. So really didn't matter. Really didn't matter. There was negative side effects. The idea that you could get something for nothing far exceeded the costs. You know, they just said, and it, until somebody had a problem and saw a doctor and said, let's stop doing this, they really didn't associate what their problem was. So that's aspartame. Let's take a little look at sucralose. So I can't emphasize enough, if you can identify aspartame in any, any of the, the foods you're taking, please don't do it. You're, you're, you're uh, risking a lot. Okay, Splenda, chlorinated glucose. Sucralose, which was later marketed as Splenda, was created in 1976 when a scientist found a way to molecularly bond sucrose molecules with chlorine. Hooray, chlorine. One researcher was asked to test the chlorinated compound but misread the research and tasted it instead. That was a bit of a risk. The Not a great research technique, by the way, to taste things that you're working on. The researcher survived and in doing so paved the way to the product that is 600 times sweeter than sugar. Unlike artificial sweeteners that came before, sucralose is partially metabolized by the body, which means it does deliver some calories. And unlike others, it's heat stable, which means you can bake with it. Aspartame would have problems, by the way, when you baked with it. Few people know that. The Splenda replaced NutraSweet as the most likely consumed sugar substitute on the market. Though it was created in 76, it was approved in 1998. Interesting. So you'd say, well, it took 22 years for it to get to approved. Well, somehow they missed most of the negative side effects in the course of that time. Okay. So we now have two of the more toxic sugars down. And let's see what else we can go to. Saccharin is an interesting story. Saccharin is often something you don't reach for by itself but it is included with uh, mixes of aspartame. And one of the, the benefits of saccharin is that it can mix it with other artificial sweeteners and it doesn't make a problem, a, a, a unique problem. So it's kind of hidden in with a lot of other things. Uh, saccharin, this is a great story about saccharin. Saccharin was named to the Latin word of sugar, which uh, was discovered uh, accidentally in 1897 by a Johns Hopkins researcher who was looking for new uses for coal tar derivatives. You probably don't know this, but coal tar derivatives, coal tar soap was really popular in the late uh, 1800s and early 1900s. I know this only because when we used to go visit our grandmother, we'd find um, coal tar soap. I had no idea what that was. That goes way back. So anyways, he forgot to wash his hand, and before lunch, he tasted something sweet on his fingers. After tasting everything in his lab to determine the source, he figured out it was from the coal tar, which is now 300 times more sweeter than sugar. So this is the first one out of the blocks. Here's a fun fact. Monsanto got its start in 1901 with saccharin. So by 1907, saccharin was already widely used in sodas and canned goods, and most Americans had no idea it was in their food. As part of a series of sweeping food and drug reforms, Harvey Wiley, the head of the chemical division of the United States Department of Agriculture, recommended banding saccharin for possible, possibly being toxic. The person who got in the way was President Theodore Roosevelt, the same one who started all the national parks, who was on a weight loss regime that included a dose of saccharin prescribed by his doctor. The sweetener was eventually banned in 1912, but the decision was reversed in World War I when sugar rations necessitated the use of saccharin as a substitute. Once the war was over, people continued to enjoy the calorie-free sweetener. Isn't that amazing? The introduction of a sweetener, yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave it at that. Um, so they all have their stories. They're all available out there now, except for cyclamates. And it's, I guess if you were to say, yeah, there's, think of two things, two categories of side effects. 
One is uh, neurotoxicity, which is basically generated initially through the gut. And um, there's tables out there. You can go on to some of the links and um, see how it's no little thing. And by the way, aspartame, of all the additives that have ever been complained about to the FDA, aspartame has a, it represents 95% of all complaints of all additives ever approved by the FDA. So that's what an issue it is, whether it's headaches and so on and so forth, the gastrointestinal. Um, people don't report things like neurotoxicity. They report things like I have a gut pain or I have joint pain or I can't sleep. And it's the bioaccumulation of the metabolites of aspartame. So the other reason I bring this up is because I had an experience, inadvertent experience, when I guess I was catching myself becoming rather dangerous, dangerously naive. So um, I like coffee, I like tea, I drink wine periodically, and sometimes I drink spirits. I mean, those are all exceptions. My wife doesn't drink much at all, so I drink really next to nothing, per my view. But I also liked seltzer. So we'd have a lot of seltzers on top of the refrigerator, and that would be a you know, make a greater variety of something to drink. So the seltzer that we were using was a Refresh brand, and it was grapefruit flavored. So the ingredients say carbonated water, of course, and then it says natural flavors. That's it. That's the list of the ingredients. So it took a while to go online to find this, but in those natural ingredients, remember I told you that aspartame and uh, other uh, artificial sweeteners can be used in a variety of foods and they don't have to be reported if they're under a certain amount. Well, aspartame and ACE-C, which we'll talk about later, um, are both in this seltzer that I was thinking that was um, carbonated carbonated water with artificial sweeteners. We now just get uh, pull and spring sp uh, sparkling water. But that was amazing to realize that. And how I detected that is that as much as I enjoyed the seltzer, there's just an odd feeling. And then I started taking my blood glucose and uh, readings primarily. And I found it took a while to narrow it down. I took it before and after and became consistently taking it before and after of this um, product, of this carbonated beverage, and found it was this. And so then I thought, well, why could that be? And I thought, does carbonated water increase your, your uh, glucose? And uh, no, it doesn't, by the way. It was the natural flavoring. So you never know. And it's out there. That's why I'm, in one way, covering artificial sweeteners is, is sort of a, a, a well-trodden news item of things. Hey, be aware of these things. But I'm saying is that don't be like me or like I was and being dangerously naive. We all want to trust something. But if you're into keto and if at least you've gotten as far as testing your glucose on a regular basis then let me just say, if you have any suspicion of any food that you're taking, do a before and after. And so since this was just a liquid, I could test within you know 30 minutes afterwards, even 15 minutes afterwards, and it'd be fine. Ordinarily, if I was taking a food, I wouldn't test it until an hour after I consumed it. So FYI, please be vigilant. I don't want to make you paranoid, but I'm just saying it's out there and there are safer forms. That's the whole journey that my wife and myself are taking is primarily for ourselves. I'm not trying to sell you anything, but taking care of yourself, things that you can make for yourself and better choices in terms of food. Everybody wants a supplement. Everybody wants a short answer. We'll, we'll talk about that intermittently. I think that uh, you got to get the diet part down and you got to get rid of those environmental exposures, as we've been saying. So that's it for today. Let me encourage you to keep on going with your ketogenic efforts for your glucometer readings, your ketone readings, and feel free to send me some questions like you've been sending me at Dr. Carl Goldcamp at ketonaturopath.com. Until next time, bye-bye. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath, same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week.